The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann. It took place on Sunday, July 14th, 2013. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon questions and answers time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And now with Sunday afternoon's questions and answers, here's Chris McCann. Welcome to eBible Fellowship's online fellowship question and answer. Today, we'll open up the room to receive your phone calls and to take your questions or comments. And everyone is invited to share whatever might be on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways we just mentioned. And I'll try as much as possible to respond by turning to the Bible, the Word of God. And God has given us this book to uh, turn to as a source of truth. It, as a matter of fact, the only source of truth. We we cannot find uh, answers to spiritual questions anywhere else in this world apart from the Bible. And so we have a great privilege and uh, a great blessing of being able to turn to the Word of God, which is the mind of Christ. And just as um, no man knows the mind of another, we, we know ourselves fairly well, but we don't even know ourselves perfectly. We certainly don't know the mind of another person, their inward workings. Well, the Bible is the expressed mind of God, and and we cannot know it. Uh, we are permitted, though, to go to God himself and to ask him for help and for wisdom and help us to understand the things that this book is saying, your mind, what what are your thoughts, what is uh, really your will concerning this subject and that subject as we read various things in the Bible. And and that is uh, our, uh, again, our privilege, and it is um, a constant joy to the child of God to be able to search the scriptures to find out what uh, is contained in the mind of God. And and that's what this program's about. That's what eBible Fellowship is um, always involved with, is searching the Bible in order to find truth, to discover the will of God and, and what he has uh, said in his word. Well, at this time, we're going to open up the room. And again, all are welcome to uh, contact us and to ask your question. Now, let's go to the first person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer. Please go ahead with your call. Hey, Chris. I heard you speaking today on Deuteronomy 25.1 and on 2 Corinthians 5.8. Could you please read Ecclesiastes 3, 16 and 17 and tell me how that would apply? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 16 says, And moreover I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Well, thank you for these verses. And it seems to be um, continuing that that same idea that when the wicked are coming under the judgment of God, the righteous also are there. And um, th this is actually a helpful verse to show that, as you mentioned. Now, in case someone just joined us for the um, question and answer and wasn't here for the study, let me read the verse in Deuteronomy 25 that you're referring to in verse 1. If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them 
then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And now what's interesting about this, and this is the same passage in the next couple of verses, that limits the judgment to a certain number of stripes. You cannot exceed or go beyond. And uh, we learn from that, that that it's just not possible for God to throw people into hell and and to uh, punish them forevermore without uh, limitation. Uh, that would go against the this law here in Deuteronomy 25, that 40 stripes you give and should not exceed. And therefore, this passage does relate to the judgment of God. And here God is telling us that both the wicked and the righteous come unto the judgment, the one to be justified and the other to be condemned. And I think the verses you're referring to in Ecclesiastes tie in with that. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up those verses. And um, if anyone else has anything, please just give us a call. Okay, um, let's go to the next person on the phone. Hello, and welcome to our Sunday afternoon online fellowship. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, I just want to be sure I have a correct understanding of what we heard today in your message. Um, In the day of judgment, which is now, it is the wicked that are being judged and the wicked or the non-believers are receiving different numbers of stripes as their punishment or judgment. However, the righteous are not being judged, but are experiencing uh, simply periods of testing during these uh, last 20 of the 40-day periods of trials. Well, it uh, throughout the entire period of judgment, the fire that God has lit, the spiritual fires of Judgment Day, they burn up the wicked. They they bring His wrath. He's punishing them or uh, applying forty stripes to them. Uh, there's a limitation on their judgment. But even though the true believers are here. We have already experienced the stripes in Christ from the foundation of the world. And uh, therefore, this cannot be punishment, but it is a fire that is trying the people of God and testing us. And just as 1 Corinthians 3 speaks of the gold, silver, precious stones, and wood, hay, stubble, the fire is put to all, but the fire um, condemns the wood, hay, stubble by destroying it, and the same fire purifies the gold, silver, precious stones. And and that's what um, Deuteronomy 25 is saying, when both go before the Lord for judgment, or both go before the judge, one is justified, and the fact that the true believers will remain and not be burned up, they will endure to the end, that is only a result of the salvation of God, and therefore they're justified through the day of judgment, and the rest who will be burned up are condemned. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. And we do have a question um, on... Pal Talk, we have um, a question from M. Razy one uh, If we were chosen to be elect of God before the foundation of the world, uh, were we judged then? Why are we being judged now? Is it for testing? Well, again, let me turn to this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and I'll read some of the previous verses so we understand exactly who's in view here. It says in verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, who is it that is um, this this group, this we are confident and willing to be absent from the body? Is it is it unsaved people? No, it can only be the true believers. We are a confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Again, we, 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 referring to the believers. And then in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's been no shift. There's been no um, turning of the group in view to the wicked, to the unsaved. It, it is the true believers who are in view in each of these verses. And also in verse 10, we, the, the elect, must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word appear is the key to understanding what God means. It's the same word that is translated as to be made manifest. In uh, verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 4, it's translated as manifest there, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And this is the same word where the Lord Jesus is said to have uh, made manifest the things that he did from the foundation of the world. Remember when um, we learned of the uh, penalty that Jesus paid, that he paid for sin from the foundation of the world as the lamb that was slain at that point, but he entered into human history and to make these things manifest. And that's what is being said here now it just to show you uh, how how god speaks of that uh it says in first peter 1 in verse 19 but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. And that's that same word. So Christ died and paid for sin from the foundation of the world, but was made manifest for you and me when he entered into human history. And yet when he um, went to the cross, he was not making payment. There was no need for him to make payment for sin again. One payment was sufficient to satisfy the law's demands. And likewise, we were judged in him. We were baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with. And and the baptism that washes away sin is the fires of the wrath of God. We were baptized with that baptism also at the foundation of the world. And all of our sins were paid for. But God has a plan, just as he had a plan with the Lord, to make manifest this fact concerning the sins of his people, that their sins have been paid for. And therefore, he brings them into the day of judgment along with the wicked and yet not to judge them, not to punish them, because that would mean that they still had sin that wasn't paid for. No, all their sin is paid for. Therefore, we must all stand, we must all appear, be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ in order to reveal that our sins have already been paid for, that we will be justified as a result in this day of judgment. And uh, that's 
what uh, the Lord is telling us in, in those verses. Uh, we do have another question from Pal Talk from John Lafferty. Uh, thank you for the study today. And my two questions are, please read from Jonah 4, 6 through 8, where God prepares three things for Jonah as he is sitting on the east side of the city under the shadow of a booth to see what would become of the city. God prepares a gourd, a plant, greens interlinear, a worm, and a vehement east wind. What do these three things in these verses represent? Could this parable of Jonah, in its conclusion, have meaning for us who remain today in this day of judgment for God to complete his plan? Well, let, let's take a look in Jonah 4. And Jehovah God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God has been giving um, historical parables all throughout the book of Jonah. And this is another picture. It's another historical parable that God is giving where he prepares a, a gourd that comes up over Jonah. And Jonah here would be a type of Christ, that it would be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. And Jonah's glad of the gourd, but uh, once a worm is prepared and it smites the gourd that it withers, then the sun or the vehement east wind beats upon his head and he faints and wishes to die and says it is better for, for me to die than to live. And uh, I think this is a picture of the judgment of God that came upon Christ at a particular time. The, the wrath of God fell upon Jesus once national Israel withered away. And uh, I, I think the gourd is uh, pointing to Israel. And so Jesus did not experience the wrath of God until the time uh, that God was finished with national Israel, and and that meant that the that period of time, that period in which Christ was not to experience the wrath of God in the tableau, was done away with, and and once the gourd is withered, as Israel withered away, then the wrath of God falls upon uh, the Lord Jesus, or or uh, Jonah here, once the gourd withers away. I, I think that's a very difficult passage. But uh, you had a second question. And let's see. The second question was, 1 Corinthians 3.15 compared with Ezekiel 33, 3-5. Are these verses pointing to God's true elect and their warning of Judgment Day of May 21, 2011? Uh, thank you and God bless you, Bible Fellowship. 1 Corinthians 3.15 If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Yes, and you're relating it to the blowing of the trumpet in um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. Y yes, that has everything to do with the uh, work that's in 1 Corinthians 3, as God says, we are laborers together with him, and um, he is speaking of the proclamation of the gospel all throughout time, but especially in the days leading up to the conclusion of his salvation plan, because he saved the best for last and saved a great multitude, and so many uh, th these works are speaking of those that heard that message, and they are the work of the elect 
that brought the gospel to them. And so even if they happen to be burned up, if if uh, individuals or people who maybe for a time gave an appearance of, of being a true believer, but it turns out they were not, well, then the elect child of God, um, he he's saved by the grace of God, and uh, he's not harmed at all. Now, and just to prove that when God speaks of work, he's referring to people, it says in 1 Corinthians 9, in verse 1, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? And the Lord is directing the Apostle Paul to say that, and he's referring to the Corinthians, to people. Are not ye, Corinthians, my work in the Lord? And uh, because he shared the gospel with them. But thank you for your questions. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer today. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, good afternoon. The um, Proverbs 15, I'm sorry, Proverbs 17, 15, and Proverbs 18, 5. I'm wondering, does that tie in with Deuteronomy 25, 1? Proverbs 17, 15? Yes. And 18, 5? Mm-hmm. 17, 15 says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to Jehovah. Well, now, uh, as far as God's judgment day, this won't happen. Uh, God is the judge, and he he judges perfectly and has uh, perfect judgment in all matters with all people. And, and far be it from God to ever justify the wicked and condemn the just. But this is what happens when people develop gospels that that are not the true gospel, and they tell people, this is what you have to do in order to become saved. You uh, let, Let's just say, let, let's go back a few years, and, and there's a congregation that, um, that believes in speaking in tongues. And, and let's say there's, there's a family, and maybe one of the children uh, who's brought there by their parents is one of God's elect. And so the congregation teaches, well, you have to speak in tongues. It's an evidence of the Holy Spirit. And, and so the congregation does, and they're basically being told, you have the Holy Spirit, and, and that means you're saved. But let's say our um, one elect person in that congregation, maybe a very young man, very young girl, and and he he just doesn't get that and and so he he doesn't try to deceive himself no speaking in tongues comes upon him and he is condemned by that particular church or we we could even make it maybe more more understandable since maybe not everyone has had encounters with tongues church think of a church that believes in free will in order to get saved, you accept Christ, and and you walk down the aisle, you say the sinner's prayer, you do these things, and and it justifies the wicked. Uh, Ezekiel tells us in Ezekiel 13 that these kinds of things, um, well, let me read in Ezekiel 13, 22, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. And that's what the congregation does, the pastor and the elders. Here's how you get saved. Accept Christ. Oh, uh, glory, glory, this person has accepted Christ. He's saved. He's a child of God, and the congregation rejoices. And Nothing happened, not in that person's soul when he accepted Christ, except his hands, his will has been strengthened in his wickedness. And now, again, we're going back in the time when believers were in the church. There's another poor soul in the church, and he hears this, 
and he he just finds difficulty with it 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 doesn't ring true or or everybody else seems to think it's true and he just doesn't understand this whole matter uh maybe he's even accepted Christ and it didn't work and and so it it condemns the righteous it it's making the heart of the righteous sad the true believer uh, rejoices at the truth it's the truth that sets us free not lies and and this verse is i think referring to that um and then what which verse in chapter 18 5 5 it is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment um i i don't know i have to uh, i'm not sure exactly what's in view there Okay, um, Psalm thirty-seven, thirty-two: The wicked watches the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Well, Psalm ten is a whole chapter of the wicked against God and the, the um, righteous. And I just found the verse in chapter ten of Psalms, verse eight. That, I mean, the whole psalm could be read, but I wouldn't want you to do that. But um, look at verse eight. Okay, it's a wonderful psalm, though. He he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages, and the secret places does he murder the innocent. His, his eyes are privily set against the poor. Well, it is true that the wicked um, watch the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we just we just look at um, the the gospel accounts, and and they were hanging on his every word to catch him. And sometimes they would ask questions in order to catch him saying something they could use against him. But, but the problem with the verse, um, oh, oh no, that, that does have application there in verse 32, that, that Jesus is the righteous one in the first instance that's in view, and, and yes, they did seek to slay him. Right, correct. All right, thank you. All right, well, thank you for that verse and for your questions and let's go to the next person on the phone welcome to our question and answer today please go ahead with your call hi mr mccann um matthew 12 verses 36 and 37 matthew 12 and verse 36 but i say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Could you please explain that in light of our current time? Well, yeah, the the um, idle words are words that are not according to the, the word of God. You know, the, the Bible says, um, well, how's it go in Ephesians? Chapter 4, in verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And, and just think of that commandment. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So, so either we're sharing the word of God, or we're uh, conversing in order uh, to share the word of God for the use of edifying. We, we want to continue and keep communication lines open. And then corrupt communication, well, that, <laughs> that's the world's language. That, that's uh, all the world ta- wants to talk about is corrupt things, uh, vain things and empty things and deceitful things. The world wants to um speak of of fictional things and 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 philosophies and and things like that uh, things that are not true but the true believer wants to speak the truth and so the day of judgment uh everyone must give account of the things they say uh as well as do all of our actions as God is going to punish the wicked for all their sins, including the the things that come out of their mouth. And 
by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The things that we say give evidence to uh, the nature of our heart. The true believer, again, will will speak things that are according to the commandments and and uh, for the use of edifying by the grace of God, and unbelievers uh, do not. They, they speak other things. And uh, this time period in justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked brings this to light. But thank you for these verses. And let's go to the next person on the phones. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer. Please go ahead with your call. Good morning, afternoon, Brother McCann. Chapter 2 of Genesis 8 through 14, please. Genesis 2, and beginning in verse 8, And Jehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made Jehovah God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedulam, and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Yes, sir. Um, two questions. Um, certainly this speaks of Christ, his gospel, the water going forth from the river and branching off into four heads. My question, first question is, the names of these rivers, were they given by God because of this gospel, or were they copied by man because of this gospel and given to those rivers? Well, uh, God, God gave the names of the rivers. This is before the fall. And then we do find um, some of these names used later in the Bible, like uh, the, let's see, uh, yeah, uh, Euphrates, the Euphrates River. We we find that that's a major river mentioned uh, many times in the Bible, and uh, even it says it compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. So here God it has given the name Ethiopia to a, a land, and yet the river and the land would be very different later after the flood. Um, the the whole landscape changed. And and so the Euphrates River that we know today is not the same Euphrates River that is mentioned here. And same thing with the land of Ethiopia. Thank you, brother. That leads into my second question. Uh, aren't the oil reserves in the Middle East a uh, more evidence of the Noatian flood and that possibly the Garden of Eden was in the Middle East? Uh, why? Because there's more oil there than other places? Well, there's a considerable amount of oil, and we know oil comes from high pressure from plants and biological debris, etc. And isn't this just further evidence that possibly before the Noaisa flood, there was a great deal of that in the Middle East? Due to no, the, uh, I, I, I wouldn't make that kind of statement because it's, it's really speculation. And we... We can't be sure that um, that would guarantee, well, this is where the uh, Garden of Eden was originally located. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this passage and for those questions. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer today, please. Go ahead with your call. Good afternoon. Could you please read Luke 21? Verses 29 through 31. Luke 21 and verse 29 through 31, uh, where it says, And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, 
Ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Okay, my question is this. There are similar, very similar verses in Matthew and Mark, except this one says, and all the trees. Right. I know for many, many years, Mr. Camping has taught, and it's reasonable, that the fig tree represents Israel, and astoundingly, their coming to life again in 48 is a sign of the end. In reading these verses in all three books, it mentions, behold the fig tree, when they now shoot forth, etc., you know summer is nigh at hand. And then each of those verses says something like, so likewise, when you see these things come to pass. Now, could it be that this is just an example, but these things that are coming to pass is not the fig tree, but it's everything else in those chapters, talking about Jerusalem being trodden down and men's heart. In other words, that was just to say, similar to you knowing that summer is here when you see the fig tree in leaf, well, when you see all these things, not including the fig tree being Israel, but when you see all the other spiritual signs, then you know the end is near. So that not to look for a physical sign, although it's greatly coincidental, but... Well, I, I think that, I think that you, you have a, a, a good idea, and, but I think Israel is in view because... The fig tree is is kind of set apart by being named, um, as it says, "Behold the fig tree and all the trees," and the fig tree does represent Israel. So I think you're you're on the right track, and you have the correct idea. And it is all these things. It's when you see Israel become a nation again amongst the nations of the world. So you see the fig tree in leaf, but it has no fruit. And all the trees, all the trees would be a reference to the churches. For instance, if we go back to Joel, in Joel chapter 1, it says in um, in verse 11, Be ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Now, Joel 1 is describing the Babylonians coming against Israel, which is a spiritual picture of Satan's assault against the churches during the Great Tribulation and when judgment begins at the house of God. And then it says in verse 12, the vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth. So we have the fig tree here mentioned, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. And this brings the fig tree and all the trees together and into view. And I think what God is saying with this is when you see Israel a nation again, and when it comes time for the end of the church age, who all the trees represent, and there's no fruit in them either when both are fruitless. And and uh, I think you're correct too, that when it says when you see these things and the word see has to do with understanding them uh, in the Bible, seeing spiritually. When you see these things come to the pass, it is referring to everything um, in this chapter concerning the judgment on the church and, and also the judgment on the world, because this statement is made after we read the sun is dark and the moon and the stars and so forth. So when you see these things... In other words, we're, uh, everything in this chapter is moving along and proceeding and um, locking further in. And, and God is now saying, okay, when you see this, then look up. 
because the kingdom of heaven is near and and uh, not here. Uh, the darkening of the sun didn't bring it yet, but it's near. And so, yes, I, I think you're right. Okay, I guess the key there is he each time he says he's speaking to them a parable. So I guess you can build into it uh, parabolically with the fig. What what I was also thinking is that in Isaiah 5 and Matthew 21, where it represents the Old Testament congregation and the New Testament, it's always mentioned as the vineyard and the grapes. And he never mentions fig in the Matthew 21 or Isaiah 5. It's always the vine and the grapes. Well, um, Israel is referred to as a fig tree in other places. And yes. and uh, again, uh, it is a signpost. It's a big signpost that uh, Israel was scattered. They had no land. They were not a nation for centuries, for, um, let's see, from the first century A.D. until 1948, almost 1,900 years of of being a scattered people. And then God brings about their um, formation through a tremendous uh, tragedy of uh, Nazi Germany. And, and now they desperately want a homeland. And so they come together again in the Middle East. And, and the world is sympathetic as a result of what happened to them in the concentration camps. And they are granted a homeland, and that is the hand of God to, I think, bring a portion of the scriptures to pass that the fig tree is in leaf. But you're correct, it does mention all the trees, and and so um, even as Israel itself is a type and figure of the church, all the trees would be pointing to the churches and congregations. Likewise, being without fruit. And that's the situation today. The church is fruitless, just as national Israel has no fruit. They uh, do not have the Spirit of God. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, comments and those verses. And let's go to the next person. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer. Hi, Brother McCann. I just wanted to go to Judges. Chapter 14, verses 5 through 10. And I just wanted to see if we knew what the spiritual meaning behind Samson and the honey from the carpets of the lion. Oh, and I'll oh take okay. My well, off the air. All right. Thank you. Let's thank read you. these verses in Judges 14, beginning in verse 5. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of Jehovah came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion and he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat but he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion and this uh, is um, uh, another historical parable which means that it truly happened uh, samson did kill this lion he did return at a later time and and see a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass. But it's uh, painting a spiritual picture, and that is that the lion here that is slain uh, is pointing to Christ, who is the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Bible tells us. And as a result of the lion being killed, the swarm of bees developed uh, and, and the honey uh, developed in the carcass of the lion. And likewise, as a result of the death of Christ, there there came 
the elect people. And the word um, here, swarm of bees, the, the word swarm, if I remember, is actually a word that means congregation. And it points to church. In this case, it would be the eternal church, even though Christ's death did also establish the corporate church. Um, yet uh, here, I think we can understand it to be believers, a congregation of bees and honey. And the honey would identify with the word of God and as, as God's word is sweet as honey. And, and this all comes from the carcass, from the dead body of the lion, just as the gospel and the body of believers, the congregation of the elect, are a result of the dead body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But thank you for bringing up this verse. And um, let me check. We do have one other um, comment on Pal Talk. Jerry Black writes, Please compare Psalm 3732, The Wicked Watcheth, with 1 Samuel 4.13. Okay, let's go to 1 Samuel 4 and verse 13. And when he came lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And let's see, if uh, can you explain what does the Lord mean? Well, uh, oh, you just wanted to compare this with um, this verse with Eli watching. Well, Eli um, was not a child of God. He, uh, he was the high priest of Israel in Shiloh, and he had responsibility. Uh, he was basically a caretaker of the ark, and he foolishly allowed the ark to be carried into battle. And when Israel fought the Philistines and the ark was taken captive by the Philistines and was in the land of the Philistines for seven months. So here Eli knows he has done wrong. And, and so he's watching desperately, hoping that, that the ark might return and, and he might not have um you know when we do wrong things and we're we're desperately hoping that things work out even though we did wrong well this uh, this is what Eli was doing okay um we have another question from pal talk um echo 2011 writes can you explain what does the lord mean in Isaiah 61 8 when he says he loves judgment. Okay, in Isaiah 61, verse 8, For I, Jehovah, love judgment, and I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. This, this is a verse that we have to be careful with, because God also tells us that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And, and once we understand that the word judgment is a word that can be used to describe the word of God or the law of God itself, then verses like this make uh, perfect sense. The Lord loves his word. He loves every, every jot and every tittle. It is a holy and perfect word, and so he loves judgment. And that includes everything uh, in the Bible. Uh, he he loves the perfect standard of his law, and, uh, and so forth. But thank you for bringing up that verse. And let's see, uh, we have another question from Marie. Uh, Job 5, verses 12 through 14. Could you please explain these verses? Job chapter 5, and beginning in verse 12. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. 
They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. Well, the Lord here is, so he disappoints the devices of the crafty. He takes the wise in their own craftiness. That is, God um, fights against the wicked. He fights against those who, in their wisdom, for instance, think they're wiser than God. Oh, they have all the answers. If you listen to the world, oh, sure, we know where we came from. We know how it all came together. And if you were listening to the same world say the same thing 30, 40 years ago, they would say that the world was millions of years old. But now the same world, just as confidently, uh, declares that it's billions of years. That's quite a difference. And yet they're fully sure that they know exactly how things developed and it, 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 it is ridiculous. It, there is no other way of putting it when man cannot know with any certainty things that happened 100 years ago. We um, have great gaps of understanding in recent history, and, and yet we, uh, we think that we can know things that happened uh, before the world was created. We think we can know things that happen uh, supposedly in, in some, uh, I don't know what you call it, before there was anything. Uh, mankind has no explanation for that, just things exploded. Where those things came from in order to explode, well, they just kind of don't get into that. But things exploded, and then things began to develop until things fell into place in in such wonderful, amazingly, and, and many times beautiful ways that we have flowers and trees and birds and cats and people and all the this intricate design that's apparent in all these things. It's all just happenstance, and it's all by accident. It, it's the... You, you just can't say how foolish that is, how ridiculous that is, how idiotic that is. And yet the world says that they, they know they have the answers. And so God takes the wise in their own craftiness and they meet with darkness in the daytime. Mankind is in darkness. And as far as the Bible's concerned, when uh, darkness and spiritual things as being ignorant. They lack understanding of very simple things that God explains and declares. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is the truth. There is the light. And yet man would rather uh, grope around in, in um, trusting his own mind rather than the infinite mind of God. But thank you for these verses, and let's go to the phones. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer. Please, go ahead with your call. Yes, Chris. Uh, very good. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, nice study. Very good. Very in there. Uh, the fact that we keep our attention on Christ, on his word, not on other people, is very good. You delineated and you critiqued that very well this morning. Um, people who are so-called believers are really riling and so on. We're not to pay them any attention uh, per se. We don't have to prove them, as you said in another study, and it says in the Bible, we don't have to prove to them anything. That's what they're trying to do is uh, to provoke us, but really we waste our time even staying with them. We pray for them. We love them. But uh, if uh, God has them, they'll, they'll be with God. Um, if not, then he won't. Uh, yeah, I just like to rejoice. It says in Jeremiah 15, 11, that uh, in the, he'll, he'll, in, uh, he'll treat his uh, people well in affliction. Also in uh, Psalm 62, 4, it says they only look to cast Christ down. We know. Um, you know, it says in Isaiah 33 that... Uh, Wisdom and stability and such will be our uh, security in the time, uh, and that we'll get to dwell in the fires. I think that's also 
in uh, Isaiah 33. Uh, but this morning, the, the things you had about judgment, yes, were in the judgment and the watch. All of that was just excellent, and I appreciate you doing the studies. Um, I had a question. Let's see. Uh, that that was pretty much it, except that uh, in uh, okay. Revelation 19, we are rejoicing. Uh, you know, it's a sad time. Yeah, there's, you know, this and that. But when we see Christ, he does all things well. So whether it's our relatives that are really free will or anybody else, I can see and look to Christ and thanking that he had mercy on me and, and those he did because he had to become sin and death for them. And he's such a glorious and holy God and, and does all things well. And someday it'll all be complete. So if I can just, or we can just remember that, it's it's a time uh, to rejoice in the day of judgment. You did a very good job about that this morning. But I just want to say thanks, Chris, for doing uh, such a good job that God has uh, brought you to do and remain calm and joyful in, in this and, and praising God. Thanks, Chris. Well, thank you for your comments. And, and by the way, um, you know, as as you're referring to the wicked watches the righteous and, and we just leave them to God, That that's true. And the the only reason we're discussing that is because the Bible directed us to discuss it with the verse uh, in Psalm thirty seven thirty two and and now we'll go on to the next verse. We sure. we take our focus off of uh, the the wicked and what they're doing. It's only as God brings them up, and we keep it on God's word. But thanks again, and that, let's that, go. That was very good that you did that because it made it clear. So good. Thank you, Chris. All right. Well, thank you. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer. Please go ahead with your call. Yes. Hi, Chris. I was wondering if you could look at two verses, uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 28, and Luke chapter 17, verse 37. Mm Mm-hmm. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's Matthew twenty four twenty eight, And then Luke 17, um, verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Well, uh, you know, this this verse, we uh, we know that the church is desolate. And, and the church, uh, the churches and congregations of the world have been abandoned by God, and therefore they're like a dead carcass uh, in that sense. But God also speaks of Judgment Day in, in the sense of um, the, uh, the Last Supper, or not the Last Supper, but the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, and we find fowls feasting upon the wicked in revelation chapter 19 it says in verse 17 i saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all fowls that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great god they may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and bond both small and great So this uh, is an image that God is giving us concerning Judgment Day. And so the uh, reference in Matthew and Luke of the carcass and the eagles gathered together, I think can have application both to the church and to the world in judgment because it's, again, the same judgment. It's an identical judgment upon them. God's wrath has fallen first on the church and and now on the world. But thank you for bringing thank up you. those verses. And we have one more question we're going to take from Pal Talk, and then this will be our last question today. John Lafferty writes, What should the believer's approach be in sharing truth? Given the desolate fire and brimstone, Deuteronomy 29-23 landscape, the famine in the land, and that we don't know who... God's sheep are. Well, yes, you know, the verse 
that's being mentioned there, Deuteronomy 29.23 says, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which Jehovah overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Now let's look at the picture that God is giving and imagine you're back and we're all back there in, in the days of Sodom. And God has just rained down fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the other two cities, Adma and Zeboam. And the Lord overthrew them in his wrath. Fire and brimstone has uh, burnt up the land. In order to, to get a better image of that, consider Mount St. Helens, the volcano that exploded a few years back. And, and remember all of the destruction and the damage, the ash that covered many miles as a result. And, and I think we'd have a fairly good picture of what happened to these cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah and the other two. Fire and brimstone has destroyed them. Now, are you going to take your seed and, and, and go forth? and start sowing your seed upon this kind of landscape? Are you going to um, throw seed here and throw seed there? And No, no. The whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, God is saying. And and so obviously, the sowing seed process comes to an end. You cannot sow ground that has just experienced fire and brimstone. You, you just can't do it. Nothing will grow. And that's what God is telling us concerning sowing the gospel seed as, as he likens the gospel to seed in the parable of the sower, I think that's in Matthew 13 and, and maybe Mark 4. And so God is indicating, look, it's judgment day. Spiritually, fire and brimstone is raining down upon the earth. Therefore, do not sow your seed. And, and that means we are not to share the gospel with any intent of people hearing and becoming saved, and this is all a figure, it's spiritual language, the ground is burnt, and you cannot sow the seed. And that means God has ended his salvation plan, and, and this is one of the pictures that he uses to help us understand what he's done. But we can share truth in order to feed sheep. And basically, the, the only difference is from sharing uh, biblical information in order to people hear and become saved and, and sharing truth in order to feed sheep is that the intent, it's the, the reason, the purpose behind sharing the information. And also, obviously, if we're saying that judgment day has come, that God is no longer saving, and we're to feed sheep. We're also mentioning that quite a bit, and, and we're getting into discussing that, whereas people who deny that God has done that, they, they will uh, share things from the Bible and not mention those things. They're, they're going to act as if today is like any other day. And it just it's very, very similar to the churches when when churches would hear God had judged them and um, had left them desolate. And you're not to keep preaching in the church, are you? Why not? Because it would have no effect. And it's similar that people in the churches would just continue. Oh, no, we're. We're going to keep acting like it's any other day. 
it's any other time period. God's been with us for almost two millennium. He'll continue to be with us. We, we're just not going to listen. And that's exactly what some are doing today. Well, God has been saving all through history, and we're going to just continue acting as if he's saving and continue doing what we've been doing. And it's a very similar attitude to those that were in the churches and congregations. It is a dismissive attitude of just um, putting aside the many things that the Bible says concerning the day of judgment and, and just acting as if, well, it's like any other time. And we cannot do that. We are not to sow seed at this time. We're not to share the gospel with an evangelistic ingredient in hoping people become saved. But thank you for that question and for the verse. And I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions and your comments this afternoon and especially for bringing up the Bible verses, we had an opportunity to read and consider. Lord willing, we'll have another question and answer tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time online, and you can reach us by phone or the same ways you contacted us today. And also tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're having a text question and answer, Lord willing, on Facebook in the Sunday Open Question and Answer group. And uh, all are welcome. If you are on Facebook, you can type that group in or you can um, send a message to me on Facebook and I'll I'll try to get you into that group. Um, But again, that's from 9 to 10.30 p.m. tonight. And if If possible, please join us then. But for now, I'm going to say um, good afternoon, and we'll return to our online worship and fellowship. And may the Lord uh, richly bless his people, and may his perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us here on eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon questions and answers time. You can hear this broadcast each and every Sunday around 1 o'clock Eastern. And don't forget, you can also join us for yet another live questions and answers time Friday evenings at about 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have a pleasant Sunday afternoon and may the Lord's perfect will be done.